So, um, oh, I've got that in the view. Got the phone in the view. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got some questions here. I'm going to get this one done early where there's no one around. Good to see you, Jackie, because uh, it's a bit of a weird one. Well, maybe it's not. I shouldn't say that because that's going to upset the person who asked the question. So, no, scrub that. So, first question is, um, is there a risk of nerve damage with a breast augmentation? Um, so, I don't have much context for these questions. So, I'm assuming that um, this is a sort of pre pre-op patient asking about the risks. You've got to know the risks of breast augmentation. In fact, you've got to know, obviously, you've got to know the risks of all, of any surgery you have. So the answer to the question is yes, there is a risk of nerve damage, but the nerves that will be damaged during a breast augmentation are very small nerves. They're not sort of major nerves that are going to affect, you know, movement and things like that. So they're very small nerves uh, in the breast. And it does depend slightly on the incision that you make with the breast augmentation. There's different incisions you can make. You can make an inframammary incision, which is the one that I pretty much always make, which is in the fold of the breast, about five centimeters long. So the risk of nerve damage is less with that one. It is with the uh, 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 infra areolar incision, which is in the a U at the lower border of the areola, because the infra areolar incision, you have to cut through some breast tissue and you have to cut some of the nerves around the areola. So there's a, more of a risk of nerves being actually cut with that one. Um, and there's also an axillary incision, uh, which is in the armpit. So um, basically what may well happen is that the nerves get pushed and pulled and stretched. Well, what often happens is the nerves get pushed and pulled and stretched. So you often have nerve uh, sensory abnormalities, should we say. So it often feels... Uh, it may well feel um, numb, it may well feel overly sensitive, it may feel what we call paresthesia. So anesthesia is numb, which means no feeling. Paresthesia means it feels weird. Um, so you can get all sorts of weird stuff. You can get like vibration feelings. People think that I've, lost my, I've left my phone in there. You get people who feel like you've got water running over your breast, all sorts of weird stuff because the nerves have been pushed and pulled about. Now, usually it comes back to life, but it does take many months for it to come back to life. And sometimes it doesn't. You may have persistent numbness around the skin of, of the breast and or the nipple. So there is a risk of sort of long term. I guess you call that nerve damage. Nerve damage sounds a bit extreme, but um, I guess on, you know, on paper, strictly speaking, it is nerve damage. So there is risk of long term nerve damage in terms of funny feelings and, and, and uh, lack of sensation. But uh, it's usually a transient problem that's uh, there when you first have the surgery and then it uh, gets better over time. But it can take, as I say, a year or so for it to get better. It does take a long time for nerves to come back to life. So it's one of the one of the things you have to be aware of if you're considering breast augmentation. Probably I'd have other uh, risks or other um, potential complications higher up the list than that one. If I was having a breast augmentation myself, there's other things I'd probably worry about more than that one. But still, it goes in the mix. Put it in the mix because it, it um, it's something you need to know if you're considering the surgery. Natisha is, asked, is asking a question on um, on Facebook here saying, how do I get a quote and what's the average price for an uplift with implants? Now, Letitia, thank you for that. I am um, a client. Do you mind if I link that in with a question I've got later on? Because this is an interesting question. Well, it's not an interesting question. It's Well, it is an interesting question. I don't say it's not an interesting question because obviously it is. So, Letitia, in answer to your question, you can uh, go on the website. Well, you can get, give me an email, direct message me your email, and we'll email you some information and prices. Or you can go on the website uh, and and say, hmm, how do you get a pro yeah, how can you get a quote of uplifted implants? That's made me think now. Can you get a quote for that on the website? Jeez, I'm not sure if you can, Tisha. Anyway, me message me. If you go request a price, there's a drop down thing. Anyway, message me is the easiest thing with your email. But um, Letitia, if I may be so bold, there's a question later. In fact, the last question, what, why is the price quoted different to the advertised price? And this question has come because I saw a patient recently who um, requested a price and then came and then we quoted her and it was a lot more than the price. And she's like, oh, you've quoted me a lot more money, ah. um, which is fair enough. 
and the reason and, and it's like well i've created me more money and the reason is uh, and you know because you got to be careful. I mean, we don't put the prices on the website. We don't advertise them. And I know some people do, and I know it can be helpful. But the point of the website, uh, the point of the prices is that you, you know they, they are a bit of a guide. Partic you know, particularly as in this case when you're having revision. I'm not saying you are, Natasha. You may not be having a revision, but if you're having a revision, um, there's lots of things you might. So in, in this situation, this patient had had had, al had already had surgery. And so you can say a breast lift with implants costs this much. Now, if you've never had surgery, you know that's what you're going to need, a breast lift with implants. There is one uh, discrepancy of price in terms of what uh, what implants you have, Natisha. So if you have uh, polyurethane implants, they're a little bit more expensive than silicone implants. But apart from that, there's sort of two prices for lift with implants. So it will be it will be what we say it is um, if you um, if you inquire. Though, although there are prices for me and Kurum, we've got a separate price. So there's, I guess, four different prices. <laughs> So there's me, Kurum, with him, with silicone, with polyurethane for each of us. Anyway, um, I digress. Um, so, but if you're having a revision, it can be difficult. So you might need to do things like change the plane of the implant, like either putting it from above to below the muscle, below to above the muscle. You might need to do things with the capsule, um, uh, you know, removing parts of the capsule or, or, or doing things to tighten or change the pocket. So there may be things required for revision surgery. And this is why a lot, I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons why you might find that surgeons are, Maybe I shouldn't generalize, but I think I'm right in saying that surgeons will be a bit um, reluctant sort of to, 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 to take on revision surgery for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's difficult. I mean, revision surgery is difficult because there's scarring there. And, you know, and it can be more expensive because you, it might take more, you know, fact, facts, more, in the, more time in theater, more risk of complications, more risks of potential more revisions. Because of course, once you pay for surgery, it's a it's a fixed price package. So if you need more surgery or if things aren't right, then you don't have to pay. And so that can be factored into the initial cost because we, um, you know, might need to do more op more work, etc. So it is sometimes difficult to um, be precise with the quote when it's revision surgery, when you, as in when you've had surgery before. If you've not had surgery before then the prices are what they are. There's not, it's not like we're going to say a breast augmentation exists and you're going to come and we're going to say it's a different amount because the breast augmentation is a breast augmentation. Similarly, a breast lift with implants or a breast, you know, lift or whatever. But, um, but yeah, that's why, and that's what led to this situation where we did actually say a breast lift with implants is this much. And then she came to the clinic and we said, actually, it's this much. But that was because we we're having to change the plane, because we we're having to do things with the capsule, and and there was more work involved than someone who would be just be having a breast imp lift with implants without you know having had previous surgery. I hope that's cleared that up. So, Letitia, bottom line, if you want a quote, drop me an email, and I, that's made me think now. I don't think you can request a quote for an uplift of implants on our website. Thank you for pointing that out to me. God, boom, light bulb moment. That. Um, Amy Summerbonny. Um, hi, Jonathan. Looking forward to hearing of you with dates for my extended tummy tuck and boob lift with implants and arm lift. Awesome. That's a lot of work. Uh, this is my extended tummy tuck, boob lift with implants and arm lift. So I think that is going to be um, split up a bit there. And yes, I think your name's not Amy. <laughs> What is it? That's the problem with Facebook. People say, oh, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week and stuff like that. And I'm like, OK. And they're like, oh, yeah, my name's, you know, Sandra, you know, whatever. And then I'm like, well, anyway. but yes, um, yes, I think we do. I think we're going to split them, aren't we? So I'm very much looking forward to that, too. Um, Khan is here. Long time no see, Khan. I say that. I think you were here last week, weren't you? But anyway. Um, Tracy's using the appropriate um, hashtag. So there you go. Well done, Tracy. Uh, oh, ask JJ evening. I hope you had a good week. I will be quiet tonight. Don't be quiet tonight, Tracy. Don't be quiet tonight. Yeah, no, the whole point is interaction. It's audience participation. Yeah. Come on, Instagram. Have a word with yourselves. What's happening on Instagram? Lucia Rosetix, Bojo, Indie Gandam. Um, 
Oh, Amy, I can in a few weeks ago. I came in a few. Yes, I know you did. I know you did. I do know who you are. Um, I worked it out from the surgery. Um, so, uh, right, I've got to go back to the top of questions now. I've got to go back to the top because I've done the top question and I've done the bottom question. Now I'm going middle, right? Here we go. Again, we need a bit of contest on this one, guys. I'm unhappy with the size of my implants. How long do I have to wait before replacing them? I mean, this always makes this is not one you want to read, is it? On a on a Tuesday night, and when you're doing a nice, you know, live Q and A, I'm sitting here thinking, who's that? Who's unhappy with their implants? I didn't know. I didn't hear about that. Now I'm hoping it's not my patient. Let's let's keep our finger. Let's assume this is not my patient, shall we? But you know, if it is, fair enough. Um, unhappy if you're unhappy with the size of your implants, the how long? Would, I mean, it's a difficult one. It is. It does take a while for things to settle, and you, and it is a big deal having implants. There's no question about it. It is a big deal. It's a big deal emotionally. It's a big deal um, physically. If, as I say, it feels strange. There's nerve problems. Things feel weird. So you know, there's no question that it does look and feel weird when you first have it done. And I normally say things start to settle about three months. Um, so it's three months before things start to settle. That's number one. Number two, you've got to be a bit careful in terms of doing revision surgery too soon because when you've just had surgery, everything's healing and everything's a bit woody and a bit sort of, um, you know, it's just not very nice doing surgery too soon. So it might sound a bit weird that because you might say, look, the sooner I have the surgery, the better. I understand that. But actually, you've got to leave things to settle because then things are a bit more pliable and it gets a bit more um uh, a bit easier to do the surgery. So I would say the absolute bottom line bare minimum is three months, but um, the longer the better is, is the, is the frank answer because things change and they do take six, 12, 18 months to change. And it's always a balance because we don't have an unhappy patient for too long. We don't want to leave you unhappy for 18 months and then change your implants and then you're happy because then you've been unhappy for 18 months. But the reality is that things do often change and settle in the first, you know, six to 12 months. And so I guess it depends on the degree of unhappiness um, and the degree of the pro if, like, if you're sort of way off. So if it's like way too small or way too big or one's bigger than the other or one's higher than the other, you know, if it's way off and you think, well, actually, that's not going to settle, then you'd probably be inclined to do it a bit sooner then if it's like a little bit here and a little bit there, you're like, well, that might get better, you know, that might that might improve a bit. Um, maybe best to leave it. So we do have to sort of um, we do have to sort of work with you with that. Try and do do it at the right time for you. But the bottom line is, the longer the better. That's that's the, that's that one. Um, Tori, good evening. Just one. Oh, sorry, I've gone to Instagram. I've got Facebook. Right, let's do Instagram. Just wondering is it's still easy to have a mammogram with over the muscle implants. Yes, Tori, it is. It's, um, uh, I'm not sure if easy is the right word. It's possible, should we just say. There's no problem with having a mammogram with over the muscle implants. They just have to change their way, the way they do it. They do it at a slight angle. You'll feel that the breast is being a bit squashed, but that's um, that's okay. Um, you'd have to, you know, people worry the implants being damaged, but you have to put quite a lot of force on the implant to damage it. So, um, yep, yeah, absolutely fine to have a mammogram with it over the muscle implants. Amy, yes, Simon, just tuned in between patients in clinic. Look at this, Simon Monkhouse has just, look at what time is it? 7.17 and he's got patients in clinic. What? What a guy, what a man. He does clinics till 7.17 at night. Simon, have a word with yourself and finish your clinics at half four, man. Goodness me, late night clinic. You know, it's getting dark. Honestly, I've got to be honest, though, I do a clinic on a Wednesday evening myself, so I can't I can't talk. Patients like the evenings, don't they? They like the evenings and weekends. So, yeah, fair enough. So that's good that you're tuning in, Simon. Thanks for keeping up the numbers. Um, Tracy. OK, here we go. Tracy. Yeah, we can't keep a good woman down. When do you recommend to go to stage two? As in compression wear. Let's go to stage two. You will be told when to go to stage two. God, what is stage two, Tracy? Is there a stage two? Stage two compression wear. Blimey. Um, I don't know what you're on about, Tracy, to be quite honest with you. I don't go to stage two. We only have one stage of compression wear. 
Uh, and actually, that's another question, Tracy, about compression and support. But um, it's just like so it's like, like supportive dressings. And um, I normally say like wear like a supportive dressing for uh, for three um, months. Um, but um, no, for six <laughs> for six weeks, day and night. Um, and then after that, you can stop. But the swelling and stuff starts to settle at three months. So if you want to wear it for longer, you can. But I think it's quite a long, lot to ask someone to wear it for like over like four to six um, weeks because especially it depends on the weather. You know, in hot weather, you're going to want to get it off. In cold weather, maybe you're OK with it. So I normally say four to six weeks for uh, day and night and then see how you go. But if it's still swollen, if it's still uncomfortable, carry on with it. But Tracy, full disclosure, I don't have stage two. All right. I've said it. I'm, I don't have stage two compression wear, but I, maybe I should. I like the sound of that. You need to get a stage two. After four weeks, you get a stage two. But uh, yeah, we only have stage one. Kimberly's here. Hi, Kimberly. I hope you are looking after yourself and taking it easy, please. Simon does clinics till 9.30 in the evening. That is no life. That is no life. No. I couldn't do it, Simon. I couldn't do it, especially on a Tuesday. Especially on a Tuesday. Do that till 9th and on a Tell me you have Wednesday off. Maybe if you have Wednesday off, that's a maybe a goer. But, I mean, clinic till 9.30. I hope you've done your dictations as you go, because if you have to do dictations at the end then, and then you've got to go home, straight to bed, isn't it? No. Sorry, that's not... Uh, that is not healthy. I'm sure that is not healthy. I think I think you should um, I think you should reevaluate yourself there, Simon. I think you should. I mean, I, when do I think we finish at seven on a on a uh, Wednesday? That's a late one. It's a late one for me. Kimberly, hi all. Hi Kimberly. Here we go. Tracy's back. Compression suit to binder. <laughs> yeah, Tracy. That's not stage two. I think you're thinking of someone else, Tracy, someone else who does stage two. I don't do same stage two. I don't know. I, I mean, compression suit, flipping it. What's that? That sounds a bit extreme. I mean, we do binder. I, I, I'm assuming you're talking about a tummy tuck here. I'm assuming. So, we, yeah, we do a binder um, or a garment or whatever you want to call it. But we only have one. We don't have a stage two. But uh, it's a nice idea, Tracy. I'll put it in. Uh, I'll register up there, do stage two. Yeah, I like that um simon so my weight loss patients often everything done how do you space it out what can be done together etc god simon's asked a question right um so yes so it's a little bit different at the moment because of the corona thing so we're limited some of the hospitals are limited just to four hours surgery which basically means you can only do one thing which means a breast thing or an arm thing i mean basically weight loss it's 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 breast tummy arm, thigh. I guess those are the four common areas that people want stuff done. Um, so some hospitals are limiting it. There are ones where we can do combined procedures. And I would say we could probably do two procedures would be um, would be the most. Personally, I would do in one go. So that would and, and you try and keep, keep them geographically near each other. So I wouldn't really feel like doing arms and thighs, for instance, not only because it's geographically apart and you have to prep the whole patient and you've got the patient exposed, et cetera, that wouldn't be great. But also you don't want both arms and both legs out of action. That's not going to be great. So you would have maybe arms and breast or breast and tummy or tummy and thighs, for instance. So I would do two operations first. As to which one I do first, I would probably say um, to the patient, which one bothers you most? Because the way I would think about it is like if you have a problem, if you have a rocky post-operative course and you think, crikey, I'm not having any more surgery, you want to do the one that bothers you most because, you know, if you, if, if, you know, if you didn't go ahead with the other one, then you want to be happy that you've got the most troublesome area done first. There's no, in my view, there's no uh, argument to say you should do tummy before breast, for instance, or whatever. I guess probably the most common areas of problems are tummy and breast. And it's quite common to do tummy and breast together. But as I say, then you'd probably want to do arms and, and thighs separately. But um, So, yeah. So you you would do two things together next to each other. And uh, you'd discuss it with the patient as to which two you went with. But thank you for the question, Simon. And uh, 
jolly good of you to join in and i hope you get your quite you finished your clinic finished early tonight because i feel for you 9 30 dear oh dear um kimberly i'm sure i am i sure i am oh taking it easy yeah good and i'm very happy thanks to you that's kind of you kimberly and i'm glad you're happy that's very good um what's the highest bmi you can have for breast surgery oh Tish, what kind of question is that um well, there's no, there's no limit. There's, well, oh, that sounds bad. There's no limit. The, the, um, I, well, ideally, th if you want a number, Letitia, which you clearly do, is 30. Okay? That's the number. Uh, ideal, ideally less than 30, simply because when they've done studies, they've looked at a BMI 30. And broadly speaking, if your BMI is below 30, you can have a less of a complication risk than your BMI above 30. The main thing with your BMI is it's got to be stable. You don't really want to have just lost weight or just put on weight or, you know, you don't really want to be up and down because ideally you want to avoid weight fluctuations after surgery. So weight fluctuations after surgery can have a bad effect. You can pay thousands of pounds on a tummy tuck or a breast lift or some breast reduction or something. And then if you put on weight or if you lose weight, you might things might sag again. So things can uh, change if your weight fluctuates after surgery. So ideally, you know, just because you've spent thousands of pounds on surgery, it doesn't lock you into that sort of shape. So you're best off being stable. So that's really important that you're stable. But the absolute value of BMI, the, uh, let's just say we aim for a BMI of 30. Sometimes people have lost a lot of weight and they've had a BMI of 42 or something and they've gone to 32, you know, something like that, something crazy drop of BMI. And then you feel a bit harsh saying, look, you've got to get to 30, you know. So and they're like, look, I'm happy. I don't want to lose any more weight. I'm happy where I am. And you'll be like, well, you might have an increased risk of complications. And if you're happy to take that on, then, you know, you might do surgery as people with a BMI above 30 if they are happy with their weight, particularly if they've lost a lot of weight and they, they accept that there's um, potentially an increased risk of complications. So it's not a set thing. Um, but the lower, the better, broadly speaking um what's we got simon thank you no thank you uh tracy how soon can you shower after a tt and how often so uh usually after a tt tummy tuck for those of not into the abbreviations uh your dressings are on for a week and then they come off and you don't need a dressing after that so after so a week is the answer and how often as often as you want my friend so um yeah how often do you want to Right. Well, anyway, yeah, as often as you want. There's no, no, no limit on it. Um, so yeah, a week is the answer to that one. We're back onto the stage two here. Um, when looking at post-operative bras, should the bra be supportive or should it compress? Uh, yeah, not compress. I'm not into this compression thing, and I know a lot of people call them um, compression garments, but I'm not really big into the compression uh, concept of compression. So you don't really want to like compression. You don't really want to push it, you know. Um, you don't really want to take your bra off and think, oh, thank God for that. Fucking breathe, you know, red marks digging in. You don't want that. You want um, you want support. Support, I think, is better than, yeah, oh, well, there you go. The question, should it be supportive or compress? Well, supportive is the answer to that one. It shouldn't really compress because um, what happens is it swells. And what what, what the, the, the garment or the bra does um, similarly for a tummy tuck, the binder for a tummy tuck, is it sort of holds back the swelling. So it just holds back the swelling. So it should be supportive and it should be comfortable and it should be nice, um, uh, but it shouldn't be tight, basically. It shouldn't be loose. It shouldn't be tight. And the compression garments often have got a bit of giving them so they can give you that, that i just use the word compression. Supportive garments have got a bit of giving them so they, they can support you and give you a bit of, a bit of pressure but not sort of compression, in my view. Uh, what is the point of compression? Yeah, as I say, Tracy, two two things. I think it is comfortable. People do f find comfort for, comfort from it, but it also helps with swelling. When you first have the surgery, things do swell, and the compression. And like when you take off the um, uh, support slash compression, when you when you take off the garment, you often see sort of ridges. You know, like um, the skin's all ridged up. You know. You know what I mean? And you can see that's where it's held back the swelling. Um, the sort of marks in it. Do, do you know if you if you if you like you wear socks and your and your ankles swell? Maybe when you get a bit older. Not 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 our generation, obviously, but the older generation, you know. 
and the, the socks when you swell and you've got socks on and you can see the marks of the socks yeah anyway that's the point of compression it holds back the swelling um definitely support says kimberly thank you kimberly for that are you just answered are you just answers well yeah i just answers you know stargazers in instagram big up yourself stargazer hey jj cues can a bottom down implant improve on its own i feel mine might have as scar is now on inframemory fold when it was higher before how is this even possible well it's possible um because the implant settles so the implant does drop you know or, or settle so yeah so this 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 so the scar was higher before so i'm thinking the scar has now um become onto the fold oh sorry the scar was higher and now so you, you're saying this implant's gone up when it was higher before the implant's gone up has it yeah i don't know if the implant going up but the implant usually goes down the implant goes south so the implant usually settles so um so can a, the, the answer to your question, can a bottomed out implant improve on its own? So if the implant is sitting too low, no, it's not going to go up. But the implant, uh, so scars on the fold when it was high. Well, OK, well, then, well, and it, yes, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can, Stargazer. It can go up. It's gone up, hasn't it? Yours has gone up. It's not, I, I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't, well, there you go. There you go. I wouldn't have said so, Stargazer. I would have said if your scars too, if your implants too low, it's going to stay too low. The breast might catch up with it. So the breast might settle and the shape might settle and improve over time. So if it's the first few months, I would say, look, leave it. But if it's sort of more than a year and you're, and you're or, you know, six to 12 months and your imp implant looks like it's sitting low, I would say it's unusual to do that. And I, you know, that's why there's not really anything you can do, you know, taping and things like that is not really. But you are the exception that proves the rule. What does that saying mean? The exception that proves the rule. But anyway, um, so there you go. Yours has stargazer. I can't understand that. So you're saying that your your scar was higher up, so your implant was low, and now your implant's gone up, so your scar's now in the fold. I'm not. I'm not understanding that how that could have happened, but you are living proof that it has happened. So don't knock it. Just take it, accept it, and run with it. Well done. Yours has set yours has sorted itself out. How far down was your implants go when they settle? So variable, Tracy, variable. Um, variable on the person, variable on the position, variable on the type of implant. So um everyone's different, even within people, some in one, you know, you might have one higher than the other. And, you know, one will settle more than the other, even within the same person, but also with different per people. When they're under the muscle, they can be held up a bit more. And uh, polyurethane implants don't settle quite in the same way as silicone implants in that they don't settle as much. Silicone implants start high and drop. It can be quite sort of dramatic, I guess, the dropping of a silicone implant, whereas uh, polyurethane just sort of settle. So it is variable depending on those uh, those uh, variables, uh, but uh, it does settle. So the main thing I say to people is try not to love them too much and try not to hate them too much in the first few months, because whether you love them or hate them, they'll probably change in the first few months. So try not to get too, you know, focused on things because the shape does does tend to does tend to settle. Um, I like mine now. I don't want them to settle. That is the problem. I don't know how old yours are, Tracy, but that is the problem. So when I see people immediately post up and they say, oh, I love them, they're great. I'm thinking, oh, crikey, they're going to settle. But um, hopefully they'll settle in a good way and it'll be fine and it'll just feel more like you. And I think a lot of it is just the tissue settling and softening and it feeling a bit more like you. It does take a while for them to... Um, to so 18 days is quite soon, uh, Tracy. But, you know, it's good that you like them now and hopefully you'll continue to like them for the rest of your life. So let's be positive about it. But um, but things might settle. Um, I like to sleep on my belly. How soon after surgery can I sleep on my front? Uh, the This sort of question, the first thing to say is your body will tell you. It doesn't matter what I say. If I say, so I'm assuming the surgery is a breast augmentation. I'm assuming that. Let's just assume it's that. Or, or some kind of breast surgery anyway. Um, 
So uh, your body will tell you. So even if I say you can sleep on your front now, you'll try sleeping on your front. It'll be really uncomfortable. So however, you can sleep on your side. A lot of people get told they can't sleep on their side. So you can sleep on your side after a breast surgery, but um, it's going to take a while for you to sleep on the front. I'm going to say four months, something like that. Um, it's, it takes a good few months before you're... And, and as I say, your body will tell you, you because if you say to people, well, you can't sleep on your front, you go to bed and you might wake up in the morning and you're on your front. So you haven't, you know, oh my God, I've been told. So I don't really make big deal about it to tell people that you mustn't sleep on your front or whatever, because it's just, I just don't say anything about it. I say wear the bra day and night for a month uh, for a bit of support, but I don't say don't sleep in a certain way because I think it's your sleep. <coughs> Sorry, playing on the crystals. Um, just sleep how you're going to sleep. Uh, and I don't make a big deal about whether or not you can go on your front. But I think in the first few months, you will find it uncomfortable to sleep on your front, to be to be fair. Big question this. Uh, I want a mummy makeover, but still breastfeeding. I know I can't have surgery until six months post breastfeeding, but I want to get the ball rolling. Can I schedule a consultation now? Yes. Yeah, you can schedule a consultation now. In fact, I think it's, you know, it's not a bad thing to have plenty of notice. It's really bad when people say, I want surgery next month, you know, or in a couple of months. We're like, well, hold on a minute. We don't even know what we're doing and what implant we're using and whether we're doing this or that. There's all sorts of decisions to make. And you're like, oh, yeah, but I can't book into surgery. So I would much rather someone says, I'm thinking of it next year. And then I can say, well, look, these are the pros and cons. Have a think about it. Come back in a couple of months. We'll go over it again. Couple of, you know, come back a few times. I always think it's good to come back a few times. So yeah, I would, I would get the ball rolling now, and let's have a chat about it and see what's what. And then if you've got plenty of time to consider things, think of questions. Email me. Get on the Facebook slash Instagram slash YouTube live. Where's the YouTubers, guys? I've got no YouTube people on, but anyway, never mind. Um, yeah, get you know, get, get, ask questions basically, and. Um, and yeah, sooner the better, I would say. Um, Kimberly, sitting up, lol, like me, lol. Yes, sitting up like you, yes. Um, Kimberly, you got to take it easy, sleep how you can. I think you'll find it uncomfortable to sleep on your front at the moment. And in time, things will get better and they will feel more like your own. Um, sleeping, yeah uh why is it so important to stop smoking prior to surgery because of healing basically that's the bottom line i mean obviously smoking is bad for you and you shouldn't smoke but the main problem with smoking is the healing and um it does delay wound healing it reduces the blood supply to the skin every time you have a cigarette so as plastic surgeons we hate it when people are smoking simply because um it, it delays the healing and it's particularly important in cosmetic surgery because cosmetic surgery is all about closing closing wounds tight uh, you know any sort of facelift breast lift tummy tuck arm lift, thigh lift doesn't matter what it is you're closing the root the skin tight and if the skin is closed tight and the wound doesn't heal up properly it can ping apart to be quite honest with you and it's terrible absolutely terrible you can have terrible wound healing problems um and smoking i think I'm, i can safely say the only really big nasty wound healing problems i've seen has been in smokers if you see a really big nasty wound healing problem you think smoker i'm not saying all smokers get big problems but i am saying that it is conducive to having some terrible complications to the extent that I would say if you're thinking of having surgery, you should, and, and you can't stop smoking, you shouldn't have surgery, particularly ones where you're really tight, like a mastopexy and a, and a, um, and a tummy tuck and a facelift and things like that, where, where there's a lot of, no, particularly when there's a lot of scarring and the wound healing is a problem, then I would say that smoking is a contraindication so i wouldn't i wouldn't advise you have surgery if you can't stop smoking and you're thinking of a tummy tuck or a breast lift or a breast reduction <clears throat> uh 
I've, hi Terry, by the way. I've heard herbal supplements and teas can increase the likelihood of bleeding. Would I be able to continue taking them throughout my surgery journey? I've heard that too. I think it depends what they are. It's really hard to know about all these different herbal supplements and, and what have you. And I don't have a particular, per personally, full disclaimer, this is my view and you better check with your surgeon, but I don't have a particular issue with any um, any um, herbal remedies in particular, although I know some surgeons do, usually because someone was taking a herbal remedy and they had a, usually bleeding is the thing, they had a, um, a problem with bleeding and they, they extrapolated it back and realized it was due to that herbal thing and then they tell people not to take it. But um, I don't have a particular problem with uh, with herbal remedies, although if you do know for a fact that the one you're taking does uh, cause bleeding and you can safely stop it, I would probably advise you to stop it um, because you don't want to get a hematoma. Um, but um, unless you're taking it because it increases bleeding, you know, if you've got if you've got a, um, um, a, a tendency to clot and you want to not form clots, then you know, obviously, well, not obviously, but actually forming a clot is probably, I think I can safely say, a worse complication than having a bleed. Um, I would much rather, not that I'd rather either, but I'd much rather a hematoma, which is someone bleeding, so you have to go out to theatre and wash it all out and stop the bleeding. That's quite easy to manage than someone getting a clot, which would be a DVT, which is a clot in your leg that can then fly off into your lungs and form a PE, and that's really hard to treat. So it's a lot easier to treat a hematoma than a PE. So if there's a balance there to be had, I'd rather you uh, bled than formed a clot, or, although I'd rather you did neither. So if, as I say, I, but I don't think you'd be taking herbal supplements to make you bleed easier. Uh, if you've got a clotting uh, problem, you'd probably be on sort of me medical treatment for that. And if that's the case, then we would do things to manipulate that for your surgery. Uh, what's the risk of keloid scars? Um, well, there's a couple of probably three things I'm thinking can immediately think of which are going to increase your risk of keloid scars. One is your skin type. Certain skin types are more prone to keloid scars, particularly Afro-Caribbean skin types are more prone to keloid scars. So that's one. Two is the local and and people and um, genetic. If you've got other keloid scars. Um, that would increase your, your your risk. And if you've got family history of keloid scars, all those things would increase your risk of keloid scars. Two is um, the location of the scar. There are some locations which are prone to keloid scarring. Earlobes, sternum, breastbone, shoulder. They call it the cape area where your cape would sit. You know, sternum and, 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 um, and shoulder have got a high risk of keloid scars. So if you had something like a benign mole here in your sternum, I'd be like, oh, crikey, I'm not sure about removing that because uh, of the risk of keloid scars. And the third thing is delayed wound healing. That's more to be um, uh, hypertrophic rather than keloid scars. Don't really want to get too much into the, but you know, there are both sort of red lumpy scars. But if the scar takes a long time to heal, um, particularly more than three weeks, if it takes more than three weeks to heal, then you're more likely to get red lumpy scarring. You're looking more like things like burns and things with that. If, if the burn takes more than three weeks in, that's that's when you're thinking about sort of grafting people because you don't want to have wounds that take a long time to heal. So that uh, can increase your propensity for lug ugly lumpy scarring. That would be more of a hypertrophic rather than a keloid scar. So those are the things that would increase your risk of keloid scars. I hope that's answered your question, uh, Louise. Tracy, do you send your patients home with fragment? Not routinely, Tracy. <sighs> not routinely, Tracy. I do not do that. No, I do not routinely send people home with fragment. Um, it's something you can do if there's a if there's a clotting problem. Fragment is um, is heparin, by the way, which will thin your blood and increase your risk of bleeding, but decrease your risk of DVT. So um, that's why we do it because of DVT particularly for things like tummy tucks where you have got a higher risk of DVT. Um, so it's a thing. People, 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 you know, it can be done, but I don't do it for my routine surgery, Tracy. No. Uh, Stargazer420. Are there ever any instances where surgeon realizes on the day of surgery that it's not possible to put an implant over the muscle? I would think this is something that should be obvious prior. Yes, Tracy. Uh, Stargazer, sorry. 
plants and trees. Uh, this would be obvious prior. I cannot think of an, in, in, in a situation, unless they sort of had a change of heart or a change of mind, but it's not like it wouldn't be possible to put it over the muscle. It would be like you would make that decision pre-op. And I make all the decisions pre-op in terms of whether you're putting it over the muscle or under the muscle and in terms of the size and the shape of the implant. Because I know that there are some surgeons who will say, oh, I'll order them both. In fact, I used to be like that. I'll order them both and I'll see, choose one on the day. Don't do that anymore. Um, nothing's going to happen on the day of surgery that's, that I can't tell by examining your dimensions of your frame and looking at your soft tissue cover pre-op that will tell me whether I can put it on top or underneath the muscle. So that shouldn't really be a decision made uh, on the day, unless, as I say, they examine you and say, look, I tell you what, I've changed my mind. But, you know, there shouldn't be anything that we, uh, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Louise, I had a cyst removed from the shoulder and it's called a keloid. Right, well, that's the problem. Any sort of benign lesion on the shoulder, I would worry about that, Louise. So I would be a bit wary about doing any further treatment. So the sort of thing I'd be thinking about that, Louise, is things like steroid injections, silicone gel, silicone sheets, massage, you know, those sorts of things. Probably avoid having any surgery because more surgery <clears throat> could create another keloid. The shoulder, unfortunately, is a high-risk area for keloid. Stargazer. Decided pre-op for over, had three consults, woke up with under. What? That's odd, Stargazer. You have, you've, you've had a funny time of it. Um, you woke up with under, and what are they? You think they're bottoming out, did you? Um, yeah. Don't know what to say, Stargazer. That is, I've got to be honest, it's not great practice if you, if you, you know, weren't sure what you're having done. Well, if you specifically thought they were going to be one way and then they did surgery and there was another way. So I taught you a surgeon is the answer, Stargazer. Let's see what they say. They might have a rational decision, a rational reason for it. Jaina Mia, what's the difference between the donut lift and an areola reduction? Great question. Whoa, Jaida, out of the gate. Good question, that. I like that. Um, well, um, the difference is basically about the this bit of skin that you remove so when you do an areola reduction you are specifically trying to make the areola smaller so your outside circle is the outside border of your current areola and your inside circle is the dimensions of your new areola and you take out that extra skin and then you make the areola smaller now doing that you could argue oh it gives you a lift i don't really talk about that much because I don't think it gives you a very good lift, because I don't think the donut get lift gives a very good lift, personally. Now, when you're doing a donut lift, you're specifically taking a donut as skin to remove, to, to, to tighten the skin of the breast. So you're doing it for a slightly different reason now. You're actually doing it to, to try and tighten the skin of the breast. So you would still make your inner circle the size of the areola you want to be, but your outer circle will be dependent on how much skin you want to remove. So, you know, the areola might not be big, it might be normal size, it might be big. They usually are a little bit big when you do a lift, but your outer circle is probably gonna go outside the, the border of the areola, and you're probably gonna be taking out some normal skin there to, 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 to take out a bigger donut of skin, probably, um, uh, to, to, to tighten it. And you might be releasing some of the glands to try and tighten it and give, a, give, give more of a lift to the breast with, an, with a, a donut lift. So it's a slightly more involved procedure potentially taking out more skin and trying to mobilize a gland to tighten, tighten the skin over it. Um, but it's similar, to be honest. I can see why you're asking the question because it could be similar if you had a massive areola. You know, it could be a similar sort of um, thing. But usually a, a donut lift will be involving removing some skin of the breast as well as a proportion of the areola, uh, whereas an areola reduction is specifically just areola skin being removed. Very good question, Jade, Jada. Very good. Very well done. I can't, I can't do anything. Oh, I can report the comment. No, I don't want to do that. Pin the comment. Uh, but like that. Very nice. Um, uh, Liz, ask JJ, hashtag. Liz knows what she's doing. Is it more dangerous to have lipo on the top of the abdomen. I'm not sure, but I feel like I've read it or heard it. So 
at the time of tummy tuck, yes, Liz. So at the time of tummy tuck, so this is specifically at the time of tummy tuck. So at the time of tummy tuck, you often do liposuction. I limit my liposuction to the sides, um, to, the, to, the, to the hips and the flanks, the side bits. I don't do the upper abdomen at the time of tummy tuck. And the rationale for that is it's sort of dangerous because you may potentially interrupt the blood supply of that skin flap. It's quite a big flap of skin when you do a tummy tuck that you pull down. And if you're interrupting the blood supply of that, you might reduce the wound healing and you might get you, you might you reduce the blood supply and, and get poor wound healing with the scar. So that's why a lot of people, myself included, won't do liposuction of the upper abdomen at the time of tummy tuck. Now, most people don't need it because that skin is then stretched and pulled down, so you don't really need it. But if you do have a bulge in the upper abdomen, sort of below your ribs, um, then I would personally address that later at a second stage by doing liposuction rather than doing liposuction at the time of the tummy tuck. I think some people do do it, and they probably is probably a fine, otherwise I wouldn't keep on doing it. But I, but the, the the sort of traditional teaching is to worry about the blood supply of the skin, and so so um, I think a lot of um, surgeons will be a bit wary about doing liposuction to the upper abdomen at the at the time of a tummy tuck. Later, it's fine, but at the time, it is a bit whisky, too whisky. Um, Tracy. I've just been discharged from three nights hospital stay with stones and inflamed gallbladder. Oh my God. They want to remove it, but 18 days post tummy tuck op, I'm worried it's too soon and things haven't healed enough. How soon after a tummy tuck would advise your patients? So how soon after a tummy tuck would I advise you having your gallbladder out? Um, well, that's a bit different, Tracy, because a gallbladder, they're probably going to do a, a, a laparoscopic procedure where they do the telescope thing. Um, and if they're worried about the inflammation in your gallbladder, and if it's a, you know, if you've got a progressive condition, then what I said about waiting a year is a bit different. I'm talking about a revision of, of your tummy tuck. So if you've got an inflammation or, or a problem with your gallbladder and they're saying that they should remove it, I would have it removed. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter when your tummy tuck was. Plus, um, they're doing laparoscopic, so they're not making cuts and if they were making cuts they wouldn't make cuts where your tummy tuck are they are, tummy tuck is they make cuts in a different place so um yeah i would just if it's a if it's a condition that needs surgery this sounds like not an elective procedure if it's an elective procedure then maybe i would wait they want me to go back in six weeks yeah i mean if it's if it, if it can wait then fine but i wouldn't wait because of the tummy tuck you know i'd worry is the inflammation going to get worse? Is the stones going to lodge somewhere, you know, cause more of a problem? But um, so if I was, if they'd ask, if I'd done your tummy tuck and they'd ask me, I'd say, look, do your gallbladder operation whenever you think the right time to do your gallbladder operation is to forget the tummy tuck, just do it whenever, it'll be fine. That would be my advice. Because obviously your gallbladder is intra-abdominal, so there's no, you know, when you have a tummy tuck, they haven't gone inside your abdomen, there's no problem, you know, there's no scarring or anything in there. Thanks for explaining that really well to me. Oh, that's good. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. They want to go back six weeks. Yeah. They want my body to heal. Well, if they want to heal more from a tummy tuck, then fine. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, in that case, well, yeah. Probably three months. I think things will start to soften up. Um, yeah. Uh, what we got? This is my second to last question, but I've done my last question. So this is actually on paper my last question. But if you got a question, Get in there, guys, because I ain't going to be here forever. You know what I'm saying? I've got things to do, people to see, yeah? TV to watch, sofa to sit on. So if you've got a question, get it in before this guy goes in the sofa, and then it's game over until next week, all right? So I'm struggling to straighten my body after my tummy tuck surgery. Is this normal? Yes. Now, who's asked this? Ooh, ooh. Ooh has asked this. I hope it is not one of my patients. You see, I've got to talk to Megan and say, Ooh has asked this question. Because if it's one of my patients, I'm like, yes, I told you you would be bent double. I hope you weren't. It's not a surprise because you're always a bit bent over after tummy tuck to a greater or lesser degree. 
So take, the thing about a tummy tuck is you take out a huge piece of skin when you do a tummy tuck. And actually, when you're lying on the operating table, you can't close the wound when you cut, cut, cut the bit of skin. You cut this big bit of skin out and you can't close the wound. You have to, what we call, break the table. You have to sit up and put your, put your flex your hips on the operating table in order to close the wound. And even then it's really tight. So no wonder when you get up, you're all bent double because it's really tight because the skin naturally gives. So we don't want to do it loose when we do the tummy tuck because then the skin gives and you'd be like, I have a skin there. So we make it as tight as we possibly can. And so you are always bent over to a degree, to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the laxity of your surrounding skin. So the more your skin's been stressed, if you have many children, um, you know, if, if you've had a significant weight loss, your skin might have more laxity. So you might be walking straighter quicker. If you've only had one child and you haven't got, you know, if you've got good quality skin, you might take longer to straighten up. Bit of a paradox there. You know, the, the better your skin, the worse your recovery because the tighter it'll be. But um, but anyway, everybody is bent over double. And what you normally do, yeah, certainly in my practice, you come back for dressing after a week and then uh, uh, and then you're still bent double that week. So I'm going to say probably two weeks or so of bent, of bent over. A lot of people say, when can I walk straight? Well, the answer is, when you feel up to it there's no answer to that you know it, everyone's different your body will tell you don't push it i know what you say i've got a bad back and all that sort of stuff and i know and i understand that but just when you feel up to it and over time you'll gradually be able to walk more straight it should be all right uh they want my body thanks jj thanks tracy look at that kimberly can we end on that jj is the best surgeon by far Instagram, I wish you could see it. I wish you could see it. Kimberly has got a, you know, I don't think we can argue with that, can we, people? So um, that's it. I'm out of questions. It is time. I think I need an early night. Oh, my Lord, don't I? I need an early night tonight. Um, I will um, be back here. Gastric Fantastic. Seely, where you been, girlfriend? Huh? What time do you call this? 7.55. Honestly um i'll be back seven o'clock next tuesday right here um so if you've got any questions message me for goodness sake message me so that i have something to talk about um and i will see you then private message me on facebook on instagram on youtube where's youtube guys where's you jackie honestly Thank you for being here, beginning to end, without fail. Big up yourself. Jackie, if you ever do a live Q&A, let me know. I'm going to be there. Gastric's just put the bin out and hit the toe. Don't give me that, Gastric. 55 minutes to put the bin out. Come on. You can do better than that. You can do better than that, Gastric. Jackie was here on the dot, as always. He gives out the best hairy toffees. Thank you. Not out one of them. Hairy toffees, yeah. Right. Okay. That's it. I feel I need a helicopter. You need a helicopter. You don't want a helicopter. Helicopter. I tell you what, helicopters. Don't start me on helicopters. I mean, helicopters have got good PR, haven't they? I mean, helicopter sounds really glamorous. If you say I went there on a helicopter, but they're just terrible. I mean, what, what noisy and not very comfortable. They got good P helicopters really done well on the PR somehow. I don't know why. Is it because it's quick to travel to places? Why has helicopter got such a sort of glamorous, glamorous image? Anyway, perhaps we can perhaps we can pick up with that next week. Um, I need a helicopter for my toe. Helicopter for your toe. Okay. You won't get me in one of them. No. No, good on you, um, Kimberly. I don't, I don't, um, no, I don't, don't understand why helicopters are so, um, <laughs> well, Gastric, you weren't last. Just bloody care is, uh, is after you. Oh, just bloody Karen, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I called you just bloody care. Just bloody Karen's later than you, Gastric. So there you go. So you need a helicopter for your toe. Yeah, okay. Helicopter for the bin out. Anyway, that's me out. Uh, we can talk about helicopters next week and maybe some plastic surgery related stuff seven o'clock instagram um uh, just bloody karen i think there'll be a way of seeing it if you're interested to be honest with you haven't missed anything to be fair um just talking about support garments and stuff 
and um, herbal supplements and smoking and stuff. Anyway, I'll be here next week. Anyway, seven o'clock. I'm looking forward to it already. Night, night, Kimberly. Um, take it easy. I'm going to end the stream before um, it's too late. So hasta la vista. End stream. How do I do it on Instagram? That button there.